Hello, Tom Levecchia here with the latest edition of the New Theory Podcast. Today, we have a very, very, very special guest, Ian Smith of Attila's Gym in Belmar, New Jersey, Belmar, the W. And if you know Ian's story, which you probably do, um, had uh, some challenges and confrontations with the governor of New Jersey about the opening in around the COVID environment. Ian, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it. All right. So for those folks who do not have the dubious distinction of knowing why you're relevant, can you give us a little bit of backstory? Um, I am one of Governor Murphy's favorite small business owners. Uh, my business partner and I, back in uh, May, two months after the shutdown orders were declared, uh, we decided to open our gym. And we did so very publicly with national attention. Um, we announced it on Tucker Carlson and pretty much every me major media source uh, yeah. heard the story. Um, and we've been a thorn in the side of Murphy's oppressive COVID restrictions ever since. Wow. Okay. That's a biggie. Okay. So let's first go through March comes, March, April. Um, we're in the throes of COVID. As a gym owner, I'm guessing, you know, hey, you got to close was like, okay, hey, we got to close, I'm game, it's going to last a few months. I want to walk through before we kind of get to May. Sure. What, I'll, try to, I'll try to give you the, the short version yeah. um, up until May. Um, we kind of knew it was coming. We knew the shutdown was coming. Um, my business partner especially, uh, Frank, he is the, the brains behind the operation. Okay. Um, extremely smart man, pays attention kind of just to, to detail. And um, we were hearing whispers of COVID and, and then COVID was here stateside. And, and uh, next thing you know, it was, you know, we saw a spike in cases and, and he, he knew that they were going to tell us to shut down and they did. Um, we were very skeptical and we weren't very happy with the idea of shuttering our doors. Um, just didn't seem like a great idea. It kind of seemed like one of those things, the, uh, the start to a, a really bad story. Um, government stepping in and saying, everybody get in your houses. But, you know, at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of information about COVID. It seemed like this could be the big thing. You know what I mean? It's, um, we're not stupid and we realize that there are health threats and, and, and stuff like that. But so we shut our doors. We weren't happy about it, but um, we, uh, we love our country. And I, I think that when your country does ask for some sacrifice for the greater good that, that you should be at least willing to, to, to compromise. So we shut our doors, um, not happy about it, but we, we got right back to work. Um, we built this gym with our bare hands, just Frank and I, uh, we had only bought it eight months prior and it was a dumpster fire of a gym yeah. and we had really turned it around. We were, we were kind of firing on all cylinders when COVID came. So, we stayed at work and, and we knew that on the other side of this, that there was going to be a very different business landscape, you know, whatever it looked like. So we spent our days, you know, restructuring the gym to make sure that, that there was adequate spacing. We were looking into cleaning technologies. We were looking into other PPE and um, safety measures. We were studying all of the new information about COVID. Um, and we were also starting to pay attention to the political landscape. And very quickly, there were some red flags um, when the politicians said, no worries, you know, we're going to, we're going to have your back. And they instantly started bickering amongst each other, doing what politicians do best. And we got the, uh, the inkling that, that this was a political thing, um, much more than it was a, a thing about public health. And those suspicions were confirmed, uh, 11 days into the shutdown when they passed a $2.6 trillion stimulus bill, the largest in us history ever. Yeah. And they decided that they were going to pay people $600 a, a week for 16 weeks to stay home when the virus only had an incubation period of 14 days. Um, so that was a big old red flag for us. And then, you know, we kept, we kept just um, working, you know, we, uh, we have a nutrition store here and we build a new counter, but um, very quickly it, it, it started to, to sour for us. Um, the police were bothering us for being inside of our building and, um, I had the health department called on me because I was working out in my own gym by myself, threatened with a $50,000 fine. Um, it just, it all started to not make a lot of sense. Um, and we waited and we waited and uh, two weeks turned into three, three turned into a month and a month was very rapidly approaching two. And Frank looked at me one day and said, he said, they're not going to open us until the end of summer. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, Frank, um, 
Frank is always fucking right when it comes to this stuff. And I wish he wasn't because he always says bad shit. Um, but uh, he said, I want to open. And he said, if we don't open soon, not only are we going to lose our business, but we're going to lose our way of life. Yeah. Um, you know, and he said that he said for me that this is not about just opening our business, um, that he was very concerned with what was happening to American civil liberties, how quickly we sort of surrendered them all um, and how they were being sort of trampled and abused by politicians who were not even following their own guidelines, uh, ruling with this sort of do as I say, not as I do mentality. Um, and we decided that, that we had to make our stand, that it was important enough that we were going to throw ourselves into the spotlight um, and that we were going to risk feeling the full force of, of government punishment. Um, and we decided. So we put together a 15-point safety protocol. Um, I announced it on my social media, which at the time had, I don't know, maybe about 20,000 followers, a lot of local people, um, a lot of fitness industry people. And I did an eight-minute video. That was kind of the who, what, where, and why, uh, when we were reopening, why we were reopening, how we were going to do it, how we were going to keep people safe, uh, and our justification for doing so. And it kind of, um, I think it was the right message at the right time yeah. for a lot of people, um, because it, it really, like, to date, up until then, it was, it was my most popular post. It had, like, I don't know, thousands of reshares and... Yeah. You know, I remember thinking the next day, like, maybe, maybe we're on to something. Maybe this isn't just, you know, two, two people, you know, being rebellious. You know, this is, this is something that a lot of people are getting behind. And the next day we went on the Rich Zioli show, which is a radio show here in Philadelphia. Um, he was very interested in our story and, and we went on and talked for 15 minutes. And he was very supportive. Let us kind of state our case. And um, the phones blew up. Wow. Um, and they rang for months on end, um, so much so that we, uh, our battery was just constantly dead because it was just <laughs> people were calling and, and sharing, you know, their, their thoughts and their support. Um, and later that day, um, Tucker uh, Carlson's producer called and yep. said, hey, can you make the show tonight? Um, and I dropped everything. And that was, that was kind of the turning point. You know, I remember sitting there in the studio um, about to go on the air and I knew he was going to ask me, you know, so you're opening, right? Um, and then that was, that was kind of the point of no return. Um, we did that a week before we reopened. And on May 18th, exactly two months after the shutdown, we opened our doors to the public. I remember, if I remember correctly, because I saw you on Tucker Carlson, and it said, it was, I, if I'm not, it was like a Friday night or something. And you're like, hey, we're opening up Monday morning or the next you know, mm -hmm. few days, whatever. And I just remember, like, on my to-do list, I was like, I want to wonder what's going on with those guys. You know, when, when they – Belmar's too far for me to check it out physically. But I was just – like, I ha had, like, my mental note of, like, hey, let me check out that dude with the beard to see, to see how it goes down. It's either going to be the cops going to show up and leave or it's going to be a whole, a whole to-do. So I want to I I expound upon that because that's a huge part of it. But I'm fascinated by business and entrepreneurs – Owner, business owners and entrepreneurs reaction to, you know, to COVID. And I'm like fascinated. Some crumbled, some did great, that kind of stuff. So one thing I really like is you essentially pivoted within your business and within the framework and everything else. So for that, you get applauded. You weren't, see the thing I like about your story, and I don't think a lot of people know this, and hopefully it helps now, is you at least were like, hey, here's a plan. Here's what I think we should do. Um, my understanding, you had zero COVID infections come from your shop, correct? To date, uh, as of this morning, I think we have sixty-six thousand eight hundred and seventeen visits, uh, with zero cases having been reported uh, to the facility. And we do not mandate masks. Uh, less than one percent of our of our members wear masks. We have anywhere from uh, from about four hundred on the weekends to upwards of eight hundred on the weekdays, uh, visits. And, uh, I would say maybe 10 people a day put masks on. Wow. Um, so yeah, I mean, our safety protocol, we had, the whole reason to do this was not to be defiant, not yeah. to throw a middle finger to the man. There was no plan being presented. Um, and there was no sensible talk of reopening. It was shut up and be patient. Um, you know, meanwhile, businesses were just dying. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at to date, I, I know, personally 30 to 40 businesses um that have shut their doors forever Yikes. uh people that i i know personally and 
to us, it just didn't seem reasonable. So yeah. in the absence of a plan, we came up with one. And that's, that's why we announced publicly. You know, we could have just opened our doors quietly and snuck people in the back and, yeah. you know, survived. But it wasn't about survival. It was about standing up for what we thought was right. And it was about providing a plan where there was none. And we really hoped that government would reach out um, and say, hey, you know, why don't you hang on? Let's talk about this. Or, hey, we're going to send some people down and look at your, your protocol. Uh, yeah. And to date, that has never happened. So, so like I told you, I, I love the pivot. And I love everything about your story. One of the things I want to kind of push on a little bit, though, is, for example, I think there's three industries that got disproportionately hit. Um, um, movie theaters, and anything inside, right? Yep. You guys, gyms, and then obviously restaurants. And there's some ancillary ones like calls and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, for example, restaurants, they did takeout, they maybe went on platforms, that kind of stuff. Now, you can't do that. You can't take out a workout, right? But what about maybe setting up, and I, and I don't, I'm just saying more because I'm asking because I need to ask is, what about setting tents, tents up outside or maybe getting modulars, like, like you pivoted, you pivoted well and you did everything right, but you just had like, the, the, I guess I'm more of a framework guy and I, I appreciate what you did, but what about like maybe like working outside, working with the landlord, maybe getting tents and that kind of crap or we like. Did that, we did that at one point. Okay. Um, so we. The, the week that we reopened, we were open for a week and they, they locked our doors. They changed our locks that Friday. They got a court order from a judge and they physically changed our locks, locked us out. Yikes. We were locked out of the building for about three weeks and we got back in and we agreed to play nice until we had a federal court hearing, which never came. Um, and during Wait, that time- one, This went federal? This went federal and it got kicked out of federal. I was gonna um, say. That's a little, hmm. It got kicked out of federal um, because, and the only reason uh, was because the judge didn't want to make a ruling on it. Yeah. Um, he said it was too controversial of a case. Uh, and he used the excuse that we didn't exercise our rights enough, um, which I, yeah. Uh, what were you date, supposed to be doing? Like, do, like, like going to jail? <laughs> like, I, I, like, <laughs> today, I'm not sure what that means. Um, and, but he used, he used the guys that we have criminal charges on us, um, knowing that that's going to take up to a year to resolve. So it essentially just kind of pushed it back. He kicked, he kicked, back he kicked it back. Yeah. And we will, we have a federal case now in the works as well. But during that time we were moving 45,000 pounds worth of equipment outside every day. We were moving plate loaded machines, barbells, True. squat racks. Logistically, you got to bring it back in. Who's going to do that? It's extra yes. overhead. It, we did it for right. well over right. a month. I think we did it for six, six weeks altogether. And it was backbreaking. Um, yeah. There were, there were days where we had help and there were days where it was just Frank and I yeah. uh, using pallet jacks because the reality is, is that you can't leave the stuff out overnight. Correct. Uh, yeah. And we're not a, we're not set up to be like a group fitness place. Like yeah. we're, we're a gym. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't work. It wasn't working because of that. The equipment was actually being destroyed because it was outside. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, it, it was in the, it was in excessive heat. So, uh, a lot of the, the rubber was warping um, yeah. and that, and it was the middle of June. Yeah. Um, and we were still having about 300 people come into the parking lot every day, but oh, wow. we haven't charged our members since April 1st. Um, Hold so on, really quick, really quick. I'm going to pause you for a second. Yes. Because a lot of gyms I know were putting it through. No. Up no. until it like. Was, it was never about the money for us. And, and then when you went to cancel, they mysteriously couldn't find them. Mm -hmm. And all the, like all of a sudden the open and like, oh, sorry. Like, so I, I appreciate that because a lot of people were really screwed up how they handled it. I'm not, I'm not going to pass the buck on to, onto my members and, and our members donate. A lot of people donate on like a monthly basis. Like they'll donate their, um, what would be their monthly charges or yeah. anything like that. And, and it, by no means are we making money, but we're, we're able to survive and pay our bills. Um, and, and that's enough for me. Um, because like I said, this wasn't, this wasn't about, a gym. This was about a much bigger fight. And um, we didn't, we didn't want to be seen like that. Um, and we've received more than an, more help through donations and, and, and other support than I had ever imagined. Um, and because of that, you know, and we just, we didn't want to be that because we heard, we've heard hundreds of stories of like planet fitness and all these big globo gyms still charging like annual fees and just really, really shitty business. Yep. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's not why we do this. We do this because we believe 
we're on the right side of this. And we, we do believe that government is severely overstepping. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, that has nothing to do with our members. You know, a lot of, a lot of people didn't want to come to the gym, you know, so it wouldn't be right to, to continuously charge them when they, they didn't feel safe, you know? So, um, it wasn't practical to keep going outside for a, a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, we, we gave it a shot, but at the end of the day, businesses shouldn't have to operate like that just because some politician uh, who hasn't put forth any credible science yeah. uh, says, Hey, you have to close your business and you have to operate in this really obscure uh, unnecessarily, you know, just burdensome way of doing business. You know, yeah. It's, it's not fair. Um, and these people still take home their paychecks at the end of the day. And, you know, it's, we gave it a shot, but at the end of the day, that's, that's not what I signed up for. I signed up to run a gym. I didn't sign up to run an outdoor facility. Yeah. Um, and, and I refuse to do so. And, and I, I, I just want to give some context to that. For those listening or watching, you know, you start a business, right? I, I bought a business right before COVID. It was an ad-based business, collapsed. I'm still running it, but we're, we're getting back. But wearing your hat, right? You and Frank get together, you know, you buy the business. So that money is, is a loan that you still owe or, or you paid for cash that could have been used for something else. That you're yeah, we, we dumped our life savings into this. Yeah, you have a partner. Like, you got to eat, right? So, so, so this is the thing and anybody who listens in, I, I generally don't weigh in too much. I more want to give a platform to anybody who's a forward thinker, anybody who has an idea, whether I agree with it or not, but I'm, listen, I'm a Democrat, uh, born and raised a Democrat, but I'm, I'm, I'm a pro business Democrat and I'm fiscally conservative and I don't you're care. You're a, you're anybody. a uh, traditional it's a, Democrat. It's a, it's a friggin' slippery slope. And listen, listen, I, and, I had family members who before I had Jan hated you, right? I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, I don't know if like your context is right, right? Like where like it's a slippery slope. Where does it end? Now we have a public pandemic. You were closed two, three months. Governments are uh, uh, gyms are petri dishes, right? But then you have a soft opening. You follow your protocols. You you, you data trade. Like you know, you weren't sitting there saying like. Hey, what was me? You probably put out like a lot of money just to get oh, yeah. that 15 point protocol in place. Right. So when you stuck the Aller branch out, right. Cause I know there was like ebbs and flows, right. They were doing like some sneaky stuff then they close you down and we'll get to the, like the tail end of it now. But, but you gave the Aller, like was anybody on your side? Was anybody reaching out across the aisle? What about like your local legislators? Like this is nuts. Walk me through like the locality and, representation well um when we originally opened we informed the township of what we were doing you know we informed the local pd of what we were doing because yeah. we didn't want anybody to be blindsided by yeah. what we were doing and um this did not start out as a political thing no. um by any stretch of the imagination we we did what we did because you know and i already said that yeah. um it didn't start out as a political thing but very clearly turned into one as COVID turned into one, yeah. you know? Um, and, and I, as much as I try not to get involved, um, you know, we, we kind of got drug into it. No politician um, reached out to offer any support. Um, in fact, the Belmar, uh, Belmar is a very Democrat run town. Um, the, the Belmar uh, town council and the mayor revoked our business license uh, under strict orders from governor Murphy um, so at that point, we, it, it, it did turn political for us. Uh, and we were contacted by Rick Maida, who uh, ran against Cory Booker. Yeah. Uh, and Rick Maida reached out and he said, hey, I want to help. Um, what's happening to you guys is not okay. You know, I'm not an elected official, but I may be able to help. Uh, and he said, we can turn your, your place into a, a campaign spot. And, and, yeah. and we did that. And by doing so, we did kind of draw sides. But the, the people in our gym especially – um, we have a very, very mixed bunch of people, you know, where we're located, we're 10 minutes from Camden. We're 15 yeah. minutes from Philadelphia. We have the very wealthy suburbs on the other side of us. We have some middle-class towns. Um, we don't make it political for our members. Um, yeah. and we try to stay as apolitical as possible because at the end of the day, this is about what's right and wrong. It's not about Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. Um, we wanted to provide a solution. Uh, and, and to date we have, you know, the, there was an issue with a public pandemic. That public pandemic was very real. Uh, Frank lost his mother to COVID. 
Uh, really? She she died the the second day that we reopened. Ouch. Um, and she was safe at home. She actually caught. She actually contracted COVID in the hospital when she went uh, for diverticulitis. She was having some stomach issues. She was in the hospital for two weeks, and um, before they released her, they had to send her to physical therapy because she had grown a little weak. And somewhere between the hospital and getting to physical therapy, she contracted COVID and died about 16 days later. Yeah. So we, we took this very seriously. And that's why we, we came up with such a comprehensive safety protocol. Um, but it, it was about doing what was right. You know, there's no reason that small businesses should be forced to shutter their doors, uh, especially based off of, of really crappy information. You know, they, the governor has, has put forth these ideas. And, and just because you're an elected official, and you say something doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. You know, he, he says, you know, gyms are Petri dishes. Okay. Well, here's a whole bunch of science that, that shows otherwise. Yeah. Uh, and we've asked him repeatedly, like, please show us where you're getting that information. And to date, he hasn't provided any meaningful data of any kind about indoor dining, yeah. about gyms, about hair salons, about any of these places that he chose to be these Petri dishes. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a rejection of that. And, um, like I said, we tried to keep it as apolitical as possible, but when, uh, when the powers that be turned it into a political game, um, I think that's, that's just kind of what politicians do. And that's a sad thing these days because it draws lines between people where there really isn't any. Um, yeah. And that's, we tried to maintain that integrity, especially among our members. We have a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, uh, some of which are Republicans, some of which are Democrats, some of which don't give a shit. Um, <laughs> but we, um, we respect everybody in here and they, and they, they all support our fight no matter where they fall. And I think that's, I think that's a beautiful thing because you don't see a lot of that these days. There's this hard line between uh, the left and the right where it's like nobody wants to even have discussions and you can't, su you can't support something that, that somebody on the other side does because, yeah. and, and that's, I, I think that's a major, major issue that we face today as a country. Um, and it's, it's really refreshing not seeing that in here. Uh, we, we like to call this the most normal place on earth. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 and I want to unpack this real quick is, um, is I saw you in Tucker Carlson and it was a great interview with Tucker, super supportive, but then I believe you were on CNN as well, correct? Yes. We had one appearance on Chris Cuomo. Yeah. And, and, and this is giving you a perfect example, Where, wherever you land, you land, right? But this is your story and the story is X, regardless of what you feel about it, your story is X. But I remember watching Chris Cuomo on TV and I remember watching the Tucker Cross on TV because I watch both. I watch CNN, watch Fox. You have to mix things up, right? You have to take Yeah. Care. And I mean, if you watch one, you're going to wind up as, as these, one of these hardlining people who, who will never even see somebody else's perspective. But, but the tenor of the interview was much different with Chris Cuomo. So just give me like your feeling on two major media sources that influence millions of people with you with a static story, but even how you were treated was much different. So walk us through kind of the psychology of that because that's nuts. So we, um, we got the call from CNN a couple times um, and our legal, our, our first legal team actually advised against going on CNN uh, because Fox and the conservative networks were giving us so much airtime that they thought um, they, they, they advised against it. And eventually Chris Cuomo called, I think for the third time. And I said to Frank, I said, we should go on. I said, because what, why, why shouldn't we, you know, like our story hasn't changed. Like we've told it so many times that it's easy to tell. We're telling the truth. We have nothing to hide. Um, and, and I think it's important to reach people that, that may not agree with us. Um, and who could potentially see our side of the story and say, you know what, maybe, maybe these guys aren't assholes. You know, maybe they aren't too reckless self. Cause I mean, that, that's the criticism we got. We were reckless. We were selfish, yeah. you know? So we agreed to the Chris Cuomo interview, and I think that um, I think that we expected it to be much more hostile. Yeah. I know it obviously going on with with Tucker is like going <laughs> to the batting cages. Um, you know, he because he he agrees with us, yeah. you know, whole wholeheartedly. Yeah. So the conversation is 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 like this. You know, we're yeah. we're sitting and we're talking. There's no hostility at all, and we really didn't know what to expect with Cuomo. So I think that we both really went in with our guard up. Yeah. kind of expecting the typical interview you would get, yeah. you know, on Cuomo or on Tucker when there's, when there's somebody of, of differing ideas. And I, I was really surprised um, that he, he did give us some really fair questions. Um, yeah. You know, uh, 
I've seen Cuomo quite a few times and I, and, and that goes for any journalist, yeah. um, any news anchor, when they're interviewing somebody they don't agree with the, the questions tend to be bullshit from the first word. Correct. correct. Um, and I thought his questioning was pretty fair. Um, and I thought his objections were, were pretty fair. Um, Frank got a little fired up when it came to the numbers. Um, and I think that was because at the beginning of the show, uh, before we were on, uh, Cuomo was, was blaming Trump um, for these, uh, whatever it was at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't necessarily true. It was more so of an opinion. I think Frank was a little fired up going in there. Yeah. Um, and Frank is a numbers guy. I yeah. mean, Frank, Frank, Frank has read every single word of every single executive order pertaining to COVID. He's watched every single press conference. Uh, he reads up until, I mean, he doesn't, the guy doesn't sleep. Yeah. Um, and he has a big issue with how politicians have passed the buck onto small businesses and regular civilians, especially yeah. here in Jersey about yeah. spreading COVID when the reality is more than 60% of the deaths are in long-term care facilities. So he got a little explosive there towards the end, but even, even afterwards, I was pretty pleased, uh, um, Cuomo came on the line afterwards and he wished us well. Um, he said, you know, I think you guys have a really good point. And he, he, he said, I wish you well. And he said, Frank, I'm sorry to hear about your mother. Um, and it was left at that. So I was, I was pretty pleased with it. Yeah. Um, and I think we got, I think we got a lot of good feedback because after that interview, we got a lot more people coming in, you know, like a week after that interview, somebody came in and they, they bought a t-shirt and, Guy was like, you know, I, I thanked him. I said, thank you for your support. And he said, you know, he said, at the beginning of this, he said, I'm going to be real with you. He said, I thought you and Frank were fucking assholes. <laughs> um, and I kind of laughed and he said, I'm, I'm serious. Yeah. He said, I thought you were selfish. I thought you were reckless. I thought you guys were just, you know, being defiant. And he said, the only reason that I paid attention to your story is because you really pissed me off. Yeah. And he said, I watched your story and I watched your story and I, you know, I caught, I caught the updates and he said, I recently saw you go on CNN and I commend you for doing so. He said, I'm glad that you, you've spoken to some, some media sources that are not the traditional conservative ones. Um, and he said, I support you. I've changed my mind. Um, and he said, I'm, I'm here to buy some shirts. Yeah. Um, I think what you're doing is right, regardless of policies. And he said, he said, I'm a lifelong Democrat. And he said, I'm going to keep it real with you. There's a lot of things that the Democrats are currently doing that I don't necessarily agree with. Yeah. Um, and he said, but I, I want you to know that, that you have my support and you have the support of my family. And that was like a, a really beautiful moment because yeah. it's, it's not, it's not political. It's yeah. about doing what's right. And it's about standing up for American values. And those American values are outlined in the constitution. And that's, that's, that's what, what it was about. It was cool. And I've had a ton of those interactions since then. So, um, I was very thankful for that interview, um, even though it was a little unnerving going into it, you know, feeling like I was going into like a, like a championship fight or something with Chris Cuomo. Yeah. And I, I, like I said, that's why I brought it up. And I do remember it being a little slanted, but it wasn't like horrible. And we, we no, it was con all things considered. It was, it was very good. Now we're going to wrap it up soon, but what, one of the things that fascinates me though, a few things, the first is, um, and, and this could be another podcast is, Lifelong Democrat. I think the Overton windows there where it's so far left leaning, that stuff was that was like kind of centered is here. And it's we're pull it, pulling Republicans to the center and pulling a lot of Democrats away from the center. But that's another discussion in the Overton window. That, that, that'll be next podcast. Yeah. But for now. For now. Um, how did you pan out? So you had a GoFundMe with some real money put in, but then you also kind of got a huge round. We'll, we'll get through that real quick because I want to see how this all nets so, up. So we opened up our GoFundMe um, as a legal defense fund. Um, oh. It's not it's not cheap at all fighting City Hall. Um, and lawyers love to charge for everything yeah. down to down yeah. to the last staple. Um, so we, we received about 300, and, 300 some thousand dollars in, in um, support. Wow. Um, but Governor Murphy decided, um, and our legal bills are about $30,000 a month at this point. So it's only really 10, 10 months worth of, uh, yeah. of legal bills. Um, and, is, it's, and it's taxable. So it's probably closer to, it's absolutely five insane. months. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's, it's yeah. just that whole world yeah. is a, a, just a cesspool in and of yep. itself, the entire yep. judicial system. Yep. Um, but Governor Murphy was granted the ability to fine us uh, by Judge Robert Lugi um, in the amount of $15,497.76 per day. Um, 
And that, uh, that wasn't based off of any real world numbers. That wasn't based off of our income of our taxes, anything like that. I mean, we bring in about, uh, uh, before COVID we were bringing in about $22,000 a month in revenue, you know, and that's, that's it. Um, give or take. So he, um, the attorney general, when stating the case said that, uh, our GoFundMe was a war chest, they called it. And they, um, they, they picked that number because they wanted to cripple our ability to defend ourselves. And they said that right in the, the motion, uh, which is pretty scary because that's an open, yeah. um, it's an open attempt to interfere with our right to counsel uh, because they know if we can fight them in the courts that we will eventually win. They, you know, I always use the metaphor that this is a uh, this is like a twelve round Rocky fight, yeah. where you know rounds one through eleven, you are gonna get beat up, you're gonna get put against the ropes, you're gonna get your head bashed in, you're gonna lose every single battle along the way when you're fighting City Hall or you're fighting some big corporation, and that's by design because they know that when you get to round twelve, when you get in front of a judge who's going to respect the Constitution the way it's written, uh, and is not going to treat it as some interpretive document, yeah. um, that you're gonna win. So they try to stop you by demoralizing you, demonetizing you, everything along the way. Um, and that's, uh, they admitted it clear as day. Wow. Uh, somewhere now, we're, we're somewhere around a million dollars in fines as of right now. Um, we're still being fined on a daily basis, uh, on, even though gyms are open. I, really quick, I get like, hey, we're going to fine you an exorbitant amount for this day, for this day, not retro, but you're now compliant, you're now open, you're not like, they're finding us currently because we won't mandate masks. Ouch. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then, okay. I'm just, so you're like, screw this. I'm really going to the mattress. I'm, I'm going to stick to my, wow. So you're. Yeah, no, we, we, this is, this is, this is our hill. This yeah. is our hill. And, and oh, we, the hill are, die we, are, on. Yeah. we are, yeah, we're, we're prepared to die on this hill. Um, we never thought that it would go this far. Um, not, not in our wildest dreams did we think it would go this far, but um I have no doubt when I lay my head down every night that I am on the right side of this and that Frank is on the right side of this and that we have truly done nothing wrong. Um, and that our numbers show it, you know, 60, 66,817 people with zero cases. Um, it would be an entirely different story. Um, if we had cases, if people had died, if we had caused an outbreak. Um, but, but the reality is, is that it, it it's not, um, so we're, we're prepared to take this all the way. Um, and if, if, if you destroy us in the process, well then good for you. But I, um, there will be no backing down from this for us. Wow. And then before we conclude, as I understand, you were also, uh, with some of the money, again, you're not putting this in your pocket, but you were also putting some money out for a cause or charity or something that you were giving money to in memory of somebody, correct? Or something along those lines. I thought I saw something online. Mm -mm. I thought no, there was, uh, there was some criticism early on. Um, I, I was heavily criticized for a lot of reasons. One of them was uh, when I was 20 years old, I was the cause of a motor vehicle accident, uh, which took the life of a young 19 year old man. Um, and that was, that was used as a way to discredit me. We had a couple journalists dig up that information um, and try to discredit what we were doing by saying, Hey, look at this guy, you know, 13 years ago, he was reckless. He's being reckless now. Um, and they, there was, there was people saying that we should take the GoFundMe money and we should donate it to, to that. Um, but we, uh, the only cause that we're currently donating to, uh, we run a food drive every year. Yeah. Um, but that's it. And, and alongside of that, um, we, we said that any money that wouldn't have been used uh, in our GoFundMe would go to other businesses that were affected from the COVID shutdown. So help, helping people collect uh, or get back on rent or, you know, whatever. Um, but it's looking like there's obviously not going to be, not going to be much left in the, okay, in the I was going to say, and I, and I appreciate you bringing that up. I just, I just yeah. like to be out there like the, the like, cause I, I, I filtered a lot preparing for this story, but I don't want to prepare too much. I kind of just want to go through rumblings of what I heard. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And I'm sorry to yeah. hear that happen. Listen, like we live our lives. We have past lives. We have current lives. Things happen. Uh, doesn't define who we are today. And then more importantly, um, you know, you're a business owner, you, you know, you're American. And, and, and the truth is, the truth is, um, 
Um, yeah, I just, listen, my stance is, and I generally don't take a lot of stances on the podcast. I, I want to give platforms to all different thinkers is, Ian, I support you. It, Thank it, you. Def- and, and, and definitely, and it's definitely doubling down in a sense that um, you're doing it safely, you're doing it responsibly. And it's a slippery slope, man. Like you're an entrepreneur. Ones if they all of a sudden they say, well, you need this and you need that. And you got to do this. And, you gotta do that. and I get in the interest of public safety. I'm in full agreement and alignment. So before I get the nasty grams and I get the text message from the family <laughs> that's about to disown me, um, I just I just need to say I support. It's Voltaire said, you may not, what is it? You may not like what I have to say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. And that's try right. to support you. And you know what, Ian, uh, um, I'm going to put a link to the gym. I'm going to put a link to the GoFundMe and um, you know what? Good luck. Keep in touch. And uh, you know what? Keep on keeping on my man. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time today. You have a great day. Thanks again, Ian. Ciao, ciao.